Thank you indeed. I particularly like the title, Bridging Diasporas, and of course, you raised a number of political issues and matters pertaining to access, and of course, foregrounded the importance of digital resources. But what I found particularly um, exciting was the way in which both presentations, and indeed the Jennifer's and Gail's presentations, gave rise to, to many possibilities for collaboration and interchanges. I found myself creating MA courses, interdisciplinary MA courses, as I was sitting there, and kind of inventing all kinds of research proposals based on the chronological, uh, you know, uh, look at what was on offer, what was potentially there for us to use in, uh, as Caribbean scholars, and as, indeed as scholars who work in many different media. We have, therefore, um, 30 minutes in which to ask questions of our two presenters. So I would like to open the discussion to the floor. anybody wants to ask, yes, of course. Um, indeed, if anybody would like to ask questions of the two earlier presentations, um, because we had limited time, please feel free to do so. Yes. And don't forget to use the mic. So Jennifer and Gail, you're there. Okay, I'm, I'm Yin. Well, it works, yeah. I'm Jens, Jens Bold from, uh, from UNESCO. Um, well, I, I thought those presentations were uh, tremendously uh, interesting, and I, I just um, one comment and one or two questions. Um, the comment is uh, on the uh, transnational nature of these archives. Uh, I thought it came uh, forward very uh, clearly uh, how, how complex uh, uh, they are. Uh, belonging, the belonging of those uh, archives are, and maybe the truth is they belong to humanity. I mean, literature is uh, universal, and uh, when I, I heard, for instance, uh, Lillian said, uh, you said that uh, some of those uh, writers would wonder whether they were Cubans or Americans. Well, maybe they were just citizens of the world. <laughs> I mean, where should their archives go? Um, but still, uh, in, in relation to that, I have one uh, question, though. Uh, because uh, since uh, we are often talking about exiled uh, writers, there are lots of dissident writers in, in the world today, uh, lots of people who live in authoritarian uh, countries who have fled or whatever. So um, there, are may, there will be situations where uh, uh, those manuscripts and uh, uh, their uh, uh, archives, if they survive, they will be somewhere uh, distant from uh, the place they came from, in any case. And then I just wonder, are you aware, for instance, are you, Heather, at Beinecke, uh, whether there have been any claims uh, at this point for restitution of archives, bringing them back to some other place, uh, a country that may be has uh, gone through a democratization process or something like that. Um, and then I have another uh, question for, for Lillian. Uh, that's uh, on uh, uh, what you said about educational activities that you had launched at uh, Miami Univers the University of Miami. So I just wonder to what extent has Cuba been in involved in this? Has there also been um, uh, I mean, educational research activities in Cuba, maybe in cooperation with you, using those archives. Thanks. So, um, as far as I know, in terms to answer your first question of, I mean, has there been a, a um, a question of restitution or of returning of materials, not, uh, I mean, not that I know of, and not of, is it me? I'm sorry, I, I'm here, not of, yeah, not in, in, uh, in any of these uh, materials. Um, now, I'm, like, the, the Ortiz, for example, the, the Fernando Ortiz materials that are, uh, I mean, they have recently been processed, I would venture to say that at some point, um, you know, 
there's going to be some, uh, you know, questioning about what are those materials doing at the University of Miami, but that's not theater, so <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to deal with that one. Um, and in terms of educational activities, so um, a lot of the, um, uh, in terms of the digitization, so the materials that get digitized in Cuba um, have come to Miami in CDs, we upload them to the theater archive and then the CDs go back to Cuba. Uh, the materials that are filmed um, as well, uh, the DVDs uh, go back uh, to Cuba um, and we video stream them in, uh, I mean, through the, through the, the, the theater archive platform. Now, the kind of real engagement, both with the physical materials as well as the digital materials that we have, not just in Miami, but in New York, I mean, in other places, um, doesn't quite happen in Cuba because of their internet situation. So the archive, I mean, it's very hard for them to get to the archive or to any other kind of heavy platform. So what we're working right now is uh, creating a, um, a mirror site um, that will be kind of hosted at the University of the Arts and then their students there interested in doing research on diasporic artists or um, you know, Cuban American artists or even on the materials that uh, they have in their collections at the, the library of, the, of their university that they will be able to do the research, upload information to the archive on this um, mirror site and then we'll figure out how the mirror site will come back and forth. But at this point, I would say um, probably about 80% of the information that's on the archive has been student generated. That's a very intriguing question about restitution because I feel that's something that is more recognized in art history and in museums, and I think that's something that might start to impact archives as it starts to kind of gain more momentum. And I think with colonial records, it's really difficult to know who do those records belong to, the colonizers or the colonized. And one case I can think of in Canada is the Hudson Bay Company records. And the Hudson Bay Company was central to Canadian history from the 17th century onwards. And those archives were originally held at the company's headquarters in London. And they initially were closed to the public. And then they opened the archives in recognition that they were so important for studying Canadian history. And then they eventually moved to Canada. And I think that case, it's a little bit simpler in that the Hudson Bay Company itself moved its headquarters from England to Canada. And there's also this kind of one-to-one -one relationship. It's one company in one country. And in the case of the Caribbean especially, it's not, I think it's not always as straightforward, or perhaps it is, but my impression is that, it, that it's a bit more of a complex situation. And I think in terms of contemporary collecting, Kevin I think could speak to this better, but I think what's hard with private archives is that individuals and individual businesses or private businesses, they can sell or give their archives wherever they want, legally, it's not like government records where legally it has to stay in a particular country. And so my guess is that it would be hard to just get a collection out of a country if there was some sort of claim culturally made to it. But Kevin, I think you could probably speak to this better than I can. But. Kevin? Oh, okay. Okay. I'll let, I won't make Kevin then give his paper now, what he was planning on talking about tomorrow. No, no. No, I can. Is this. I might do it. Okay. Hello. Um, yes. Uh, we do not. We have never had anything, uh, any attempts to have with, uh, material repatriated. Um, we do have some archives that are highly contentious. Um, the Yehuda Amikai archive is probably the most contentious of the archives that we have. Um, that archive, uh, Yehuda Amikai is the national poet of Israel, 
and uh, the fact that the archive, that Yehuda decided to sell the archive to Beinecke at the end of his life um, really was deeply upsetting to many people in Israel. Um, and so there's uh, a lot of unhappiness about that, but certainly no attempt to, to try to reverse the decision. Um, and as, as far as as far as archives that we've purchased abroad and then brought here, we always bring them with an export license, so there's no chance um, uh, that those things would ever um, ever be. Those, those are decisions, that presumably at least in Europe, that would not, not be uh, reversed. And uh, although there is at Yale the, the famous situation with the Machu Picchu and the Hiram Bingham uh, <coughs> material, which the Peruvians demanded uh, that would be returned to them. That's not at Beinecke, obviously, it's at the Peabody Museum. But um, after a lot of diplomatic wrangling, Yale decided to return that uh, material to Peru, even though we had signed documents from the then Peruvian government uh, giving us the permission to, to export them initially uh, and to bring them into the United States. So that, is, that has happened. Um, the other thing I would just, just add to what, what's been said about exiles is that most of the archives, the European archives that we have, or at least, yeah, I would say probably most of the, the major ones, are from European exiles, East European and Russian exiles, who came to America, the Cheshwav Miłosz papers from Poland, um, uh, the part the, the, those those are archives that are really diasporic in the sense that um, part of them are still the, the part before emigration is still in the in the country of origin. So um, yeah, there's a, a good collection in Krakow um, of uh, of Miłosz and uh, uh, Joseph Brodsky's papers. The, the the Russian State Library has a very large uh, archival component there as well. But these, uh, one of the interesting things, we have a lot of these Russian and East European immigre archives, and the story about them is really how these people come to America and do not abandon their cultural heritage in any sense, but at the same time become part of a real American immigre community on their own right. They found their own journals and newspapers and, and, and have their own networks and that sort of thing, so that the idea that um, their papers could end up at a place like Reinick Library was, for them, really a very, a very wonderful thing. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Um. Okay, I just, I just wanted to follow up on, um, on some of those points there, because Mr. Ramchand also this morning uh, raised an open question about repatriation and were we aware of any precedents. And I, I s said to him in private conversation that um, although occasionally one hears um, or, or reads emails from archivists uh, who are slightly uncomfortable about collections which their predecessors have acquired, there are no, as far as I know, there are no celebrated cases of repatriation. There might be a few papers that get transferred to, they've obviously disappeared from a, another collection, they get returned to their original collection. But even where an institution buys uh, a collection that they later feel that they probably shouldn't have bought, there's a great reluctance to return uh, any such collection. Um, and I, I don't see that happening and I don't see it becoming a, a significant uh, movement. I, I think Realistically, whilst one understands completely uh, the, the, some of the statements that have been made today uh, and the strength of feeling, um, including the sort of strength of feeling that uh, Kevin was just referring to uh, amongst Israeli scholars, realistically that sort of repatriation is very unlikely to happen, especially in cases of original uh, purchase, because people are terrified of precedent. Now, in the world of museums, you get repatriation um, in the case of artifacts with religious significance. But I think 
generally speaking, for this uh, network and taking a realistic look at what might happen for the public good in the future, it's much more important for us to look at ways of making uh, institutions or encouraging institutions to cooperate uh, with each other. Um, and just, I'll, I'll just finish with a question to bring the, the panel back into this. Um, the Thistlewood papers, for example, uh, form part of a wider collection of Thistlewood family uh, documents in Lincolnshire. Uh, and it actually extends to the leader of the Cato Street Conspiracy, Arthur Thistlewood, in, who in 1820 planned to assassinate the entire British cabinet, uh, but only managed to kill one soldier. And he was a fascinating person who also fought on both sides in the Anglo-French Wars of the 1790s. Now, there's lots of papers like that uh, uh, already uh, in Lincolnshire. What one would hope might happen would be a dialogue between the Beinecke and Lincolnshire archives in order that the Thistlewood papers collectively um, could find some sort of common context, maybe some exchange of copies or some form of cooperation to ensure that the, the wider Thistlewood Jean, um, archive um, is, has its integrity respected. But m my view is that discussion about repatriation isn't really going to take us very far. Okay. Yes, uh, I just want to say thank you to both speakers. And to kind of follow up on Jens's point that maybe these belong to the world, or maybe at least we can see there are fairly compelling release reasons for seeing them belonging to more than one place. But I think there's a danger if we go along that line of reasoning um, that we just, you know, it's a kind of, without, without kind of also taking into account the fact that world orders are not equal, <laughs> the economic factors in world orders are not equal, and that if we kind of, in a way that may be a dangerous rationale um, for the loss to locals, you know, smaller, less economically robust places. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of put that into the conversation that I think it's, although I understand it, I think that we have to remember what the, what the kind of consequences of that may be in the age of late capital. Um, but also to say that I thought that Lillian's project is just such an inspiring and amazing example of what, with commitment and resource and, um, you know, a genuine kind of creation of an educational and cultural community, the way in which we can kind of not manage these issues, but at least really make them visible and work creatively and positively with them. And, you know, I'm really feel really kind of, you know, uh, happy to see, to see that work and very inspired by it. Thank you. Yes. Um, um, well, the question of uh, repatriation repatri 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 of documents in the native country in France, we had the example of uh, um, um, the original documents made uh, in Hangul, the, 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 the first um, printed, pr printed uh, versions of Korean. And uh, there was a kind of involvement of uh, the, the French government to give these uh, documents back to, to Korea uh, some years ago. And uh, at that time, the, the government was uh, heavily suspected to have uh, uh, economic reasons uh, in order to sign a very fruitful contract with uh, the Koreans in order to make um, the speed train um, <laughs> railways. And uh, uh, as you can imagine, there was a very strong reaction from the National uh, Library of France. For years and years, they were um, Reluctant and uh, hostile to to this um, to this um, agreement with uh, the Korean government, and uh, eventually through uh, the um, active um, help of um, the former Ministry of Culture, Jack Long, these documents were given back to uh, to Korea, 
uh, and uh, it's uh, not necessary to say that uh, they were first very brutally uh, taken from the from Korea in the end of the 19th century. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any questions to our um, speakers or the two previous? Yes, uh, I'm referring to the Thistlewood Papers. Um, in the 1960s, uh, the UWI at Mona actually acquired a photocopy of the entire Thistlewood um, diary. So we actually have a photocopy uh, which has been used many times in, in research and actually, when we heard that the papers were coming on the market, well, we, well, we realized that we would not, would not have been able to afford to buy them. But at least um, Mr. Ingram uh, had, in the past, uh, repatriated quite a lot of um, British documents. So uh, we have photocopies and microfilm of quite a lot of those uh, documents. And I think that people should um, think of that sort of arrangement because we could never um, compete in terms of acquiring them. But copies, and now that um, there are, we can digitize them, I think that that is probably the way we would have to go to repatriate our, uh, any documents that are available. Um, I'm finding it a little bit difficult to see. I know, <laughs> but there's a light in front of me. Um, is there anyone else who would like to make a comment or ask a question? Yes. Well, uh, yeah, I think that most of us can agree that uh, digitization uh, is uh, a way forward, a very uh, uh, promising way forward. But uh, the next uh, s series of questions then concern, of course, how to digitize, uh, what, what uh, the conditions, uh, how, uh, uh, and all the issues with copyright, what have you involved. So uh, maybe uh, uh, as part of uh, best practices uh, that can come out of this uh, project. Uh, there could also be uh, thoughts about uh, the way that digitization of, of uh, literary manuscripts could be done in the future. Uh, I mean, relationships uh, between our institutions and so on, there could be a series of best practices. And I, I should mention that uh, in, in, well, I'll talk about the memory of the world tomorrow, of course, but uh, in, uh, uh, in 2012, when there was the Digital Memory of the World Conference in Vancouver, then an outcome of this was the uh, Vancouver Declaration on on, di on born digital archives and also on digitization and on then uh, the work that should be carried out to to uh, uh, create best practices and, uh, and standards. And uh, indeed, uh, what uh, Alison talked about, the uh, taking into consideration the fact that we are not equal in this world, and so how uh, to empower uh, the people and societies who do not have that much power, but to make sure that when we talk about sharing uh, archives, then it's, it's true, it's not... Uh, it's uh, not only for, for the most resourceful to, to access uh, uh, those uh, documents. So uh, I would uh, simply then also uh, in encourage that we work uh, with, uh, within that context, I mean, that we try to, to, to impact uh, the um, follow-up to the uh, Digital Memory of the World Conference by uh, uh, getting the uh, uh, s uh, specific uh, concerns uh, relating to literary manuscripts on board, and uh, that uh, maybe this network, uh, as part of the results uh, of its work, there are many things there to be done, of course, but uh, I think that uh, this work on, on best practices for uh, digitization is uh, an important one.
sorry, but very, very quickly, Chair. There's, there's, there's what's happened in the past and the compromises that we may need to reach. And it's actually best practice for the future. And I think that it's not good enough to say just because um, some people are, you know, some countries are rich or some institutions are able to purchase and others are not, that the, the situation which exists at the moment is an acceptable situation. And I think in archives where, you know, as I think Heather's uh, already mentioned, the situation is moving and where I think that within the next 10 to 15 years the issue of the appropriate place for collections will become much, much more important. And also, at a time when the archive profession generally, right around the world, is becoming more disciplined and is becoming more mature, we don't need now to validate our role by just having more and more and more and more collections. We now, for the most part, have got significant collections, which mean that our institutions are safe or should be safe. The need to be moral about acquisition must be something that this network aspires to. Otherwise, we're failing. There, there's been a lot of anarchic collection building in archives, and I think we should acknowledge it, just as there has been in museums. And I think that the past is the past, but what happened in the past is not an excuse for what happens in the future. Thank you. I think that is a very excellent note on which to end. And I would like to thank Heather, Jennifer, Gail, and Lillian for four very, very fine presentations, which have certainly given rise to much, to given us much to think about in terms of collaborations and use of archives. So thank you very much, and thank you. Thank you.